Welcome back to part two of my Blender tutorial mini-series. We're manually making Perlin noise and geometry nodes and picking up right where we left off in the previous video. So go watch it if you haven't yet. Links are in the description below. Also, this is where things get a bit math heavy, so I really recommend you go and watch my original general math and game design video on Perlin noise if you haven't already. In the previous video, we built the framework into which we'll slot the actual Perlin noise math, and in this video, we're going to build the backbone of the algorithm. In the video after this, we'll build in the lerping and smooth stepping, and then after that, we'll layer things together to make fractal Perlin noise. So, let's get started. I'm going to set up a really simple group node. Um, typically I do this by just adding a math node, going here and hitting control G. And what that does is it sends me into a group layout. You can see from the breadcrumb trail in the upper left, right where we are. And what we're going to do is we're going to pretty much treat this as its own network, because it is, and put all of our octave logic in here and feed it the inputs and gather the outputs so that we can actually do stuff with it. To go back up to the node network we were working on, we're going to press control tab and that'll take us back here. Now just go ahead and rename this Octave. And then if I press tab, it takes me in there. And now we can set up the input. This is going to be the calculation for Perlin noise. So let me take a second and add in some things here. There we go. I have set up the cell dimensions X and Y here, which will change based on the layout. So we need to know that for the Octave calculation. We've got the X and Y coordinates. Those will be useful later. Because this is where we're going to be involving the actual randomness, we'll need the seed value. I've got the mesh data coming in because we're going to have attributes put on there and taken off of. I have the attribute name, which is a string. I'll explain that when we get there. And then the octave number telling us which octave we're working with. Let's go ahead and get rid of this node. And then for the output, I'm going to just leave that alone for right now. We're going to put some stuff here, but I'd rather motivate that by setting up the network so it'll make sense when we do it. To begin with, we need to figure out what values to use for our influence vectors. If you remember from the video, the influence vector is essentially a unit vector that's been rotated by some random value between 0 and 360 degrees. Because we're dealing with pure numbers here, we're not going to be using degrees, but rather radians. To do that, let's go ahead and set up a random value node. We're going to go ahead and put the seed in here. And we're going to leave the minimum at 0 and put the maximum at 2 pi. You can simply say 2 times pi and Blender will figure it out. Now we're going to try to store this attribute. And in order to do that, we're going to use the store name attribute node. We're going to bring in the attribute name here. And just remember that we're going to have to fill this in out here at some point. Then we're going to bring the mesh in. And now we're going to take the value we just made and plug that in here. We're going to leave this as a float value and we're going to put it on each point. We don't want to put it on edges or faces or any of those other things, although those options are good for other purposes. There is one little detail though. We're about to layer four octaves together and if we do it the way we have it here, it's going to have the same seed value for all four of those octaves. We actually want to change the seed value a little bit. There's a couple of different ways of doing this, but I'm lazy and so what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to take a math node, plop it in here, and I'm going to take the seed value and I'm going to add the octave value. That way each octave will give me a different seed. Then I'll simply tidy up a bit and we're ready to move on to the next step. The next thing we need to do is to take the cell dimensions and actually divvy it up based on our octave size. Normally you would have a lacunarity in here and that would determine the size of each successive octave. But for right now, what we're going to do is say that each octave size is half the one above it. To do this, we'll take the octave value and we're going to take each cell and divide it in half some number of times. That looks like taking two to the power of our octave. So let's add a math node. Set this to be power. Set the base to be two. And we'll set this to be the exponent. For octave one, meaning this octave is a one, we need to be raising this exponent to zero so that it's not making any divisions whatsoever. To do that, we'll simply subtract one. So duplicate this, turn this into a subtract, and we'll take one away. Let's go ahead and minimize these, and we'll give them a frame and a label. Now we're going to take these divisions and we're going to divide the cell dimensions. There we go. We're going to divide up the cell dimensions by the number of divisions. And we'll do that for both of them. For this next part, I need to do a bit of a diagram. I've put dotted lines for our grids. We're gonna consider this cell here to figure out what math we need to do next. And here's the zoomed in version. 
you can consider this to be just some arbitrary point, but I've gone ahead and put some numbers on there just so it's a little easier for us to talk about. What we're going to do with this point is to figure out all four offset vectors that point from here to each of the four corners. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to construct them out of these four arrows here. These four arrows here are built using essentially division and remainders and floor values and ceiling values. As we build the rest of the node network, I'll explain what I'm doing by coming back here and showing you a picture. So just as a quick thought experiment, if we wanted to figure this distance out here, which is to say this little tiny bit here, what we would do is we would say, okay, well, the whole length is this. We're going to divide it by the number of cell units we've got here. And whatever remains, that's our offset vector. So the first step here is we're gonna do a division. That's going to be the division of the actual coordinates. We'll set up some division nodes. We'll bring out the coordinate nodes. We're going to divide the coordinate by the length of each cell. And that's going to output some real number. The whole number part of that is going to be the number of cells and the decimal part of that is going to be the actual offset vector bit we're looking for. Because we're going to be going in both directions here, we know that we're going to need both the floor and the ceiling value for both the X and Y values. So let's calculate those. Getting these floors and ceilings will tell us exactly how many of these we have. Now we just hook up the X's and the Y's. Future me here. I just realized that I did this backwards. This should be the ceiling on top and floor on bottom for both of these. Whoops, so I'll just go ahead and fix that. There we go. Uh, I'll put the point in the video when I realize this and uh, have to go change it, so hooray. Uh, like I've said a couple of times, setting up your node network so you can debug it is a huge deal, especially when you're dealing with something this complicated. Now, because each cell might not actually be one unit because it's been divided a few times, to figure out how long this actually is, we're going to take the number of cells and multiply it by the actual cell dimensions. Because I'm kind of running out of room with the lanes here, I'm just gonna play a little bit with how far they're spaced apart. And I think I'm actually going to give them some labels. There we go, that's already looking tidier. Now we can do the multiplication I mentioned earlier, where we take the number of cells and multiply it by the cell dimensions. Now the number of X cells on the floor is being multiplied by the size of each X cell. And then the same thing with the ceiling and the same thing with both Y values. Now we only have to take the remainders and the way we're going to get that is via subtraction. To explain this, let's look at this example again. The cell width is one. We did the division, which told us we had 3.3 .3 cell divisions. We then took the floor of 3.3, .3, which is three, which meant we have three cells. Then we said, okay, well, what's that length? That's three times one. We did that multiplication just now. And now we're gonna take the overall value, the X coordinate, and subtract off the distance we went by all of those cells put together. And this is what it'll look like. We take the rounded location, which is the distance we traveled by accumulating all of the full cells multiplied by the number of cells we have and we subtract off of that the x-coordinate location, which is right here. And we're going to do that for all of them. That part was a little dicey. I would suggest watching that a few times if you need to in order to make sense of everything we just did. Now that we have these remainders here, we can now compile them into offset vectors. I wanna pause here and put things into perspective. As you can tell, this is really complicated from a math perspective, and it's not really easy to do what we normally do in GeoNodes, and that is to look at the output and sort of see how it's changing as we're building this network. This is something I experienced when I went to build it, and the reason is because of what I mentioned earlier. This algorithm is something most easily done with programming, and we're kind of fitting a round peg in a square hole here. As such, I had to do a whole lot of debugging. So I'm gonna give myself a lot of room by putting my output node here and sort of pushing it out from time to time. But I'm also going to need a whole host of nodes here so that I can see the output from each individual step once we start doing these calculations, like the offset vectors and the influence vectors, all of that. With that in mind, I'm going to make the four offset vectors. Thankfully, that's just these four remainders combined in certain ways. For the upper left, I'm going to consider the ceiling and the Y and the floor for the X. For the upper right, I'll consider the ceiling in the Y and the ceiling in the X. For the lower right, I'm going to consider the ceiling in the X and the floor in the Y. And for the lower left, I'll consider the floor in the X 
and floor in the Y. I'm gonna set up four lanes here. In order to combine these together, I'm going to use a combine node. Then I'll set up four combine nodes and I've sort of got them graphically laid out so that it's upper left, upper right, lower left, lower right, but I've staggered them a bit so I can see the noodles as they come out. And this is what it looks like when it's done. Because I'm never going to need these four again, and these four essentially replace them, I've created four lanes for this, but then I simply have those four lanes represented over here. For the influence vectors, what we're going to need for this is a transfer attribute node. What this is going to do is pull the attribute off the vertex that we put on earlier, over here. In order to do that, we need to give it a couple of things. First off, we need to give it some geometry. Here's the geometry in question, so I'm just going to take this and plug that in here. Next, I need to give it an attribute. The issue, though, is that I have an attribute name. In order to identify it as an attribute, which is a different data type than a string, I need to actually use a node for that. That is the named attribute node. Instead of typing something in here, I'm simply going to use the string we had from earlier and plug that in the socket here. It's going to be a float, then we just minimize this, put it there, and we are all set. We aren't going to need this string again for the rest of the node network, so I'm just going to leave this here and replace it in its lane. One other thing to note is that because we're about to pull attributes from here, we're also going to need to have enough geometry to pull those attributes from, which means we're going to have to subdivide the mesh here. And the number of times we're going to subdivide the mesh is given by the octave. Of course, as usual, it's going to be that octave minus one, just because at octave one, we don't want to subdivide at all. So we're going to add in a subdivide mesh. I'm going to do so by tidying up just a little bit and giving myself some space. Let me go ahead and add in a subtract node. I'm gonna subtract one from the actual octave. Then I'll add in a subdivide mesh node. This octave minus one gives us the number of subdivisions. We want this noodle to flow through this subdivide mesh here. And now we should be all set. So to explain the last thing we need to tell it, it's the source position here. This dropdown tells us what we're looking for, a float value. This dropdown tells us how we're going to find that float value. We're going to go to the nearest thing to that point. So when we click on nearest, it gives us a dropdown to tell us what that thing is. And in this case, it's going to be a point because that's what we put our attribute on. Here's the part that tripped me up for a while. Let me go to the picture. This is the point where we're trying to figure out what the actual values are for the influence vectors around it. That's what these are going to represent. What we need to do is to tell it to look here for that particular vertex to find the attribute value there, which is going to turn out to be our influence vectors direction. And then we need to do the same over here and the same over here and the same over here. Meaning we need to tell this thing where to go. In order to do that, we're essentially going to have to build a vector to put in here. So we'll go here. And then what we're going to do is to tell it the X and Y coordinates of the locations of those vertices, which comes from over here. So let me set up some lanes. Let me connect these up. Let's minimize these for tidiness. Now we'll fill in the sockets for this one. It's the upper left because it's upper. That means we need the ceiling for the Y. Because it's left, we need the lower for the X. And now we need to actually do something with this attribute. This right here is going to have the angle for our vector coming out of it. Oh my gosh, drawing with a mouse is so hard. Anyways, we're going to take the sine and cosine of this angle, and that'll tell us the x and y coordinates to put together into our influence vector. So bring this out into a math node. Cosine for our x, sine for our y. Then we're going to combine these. Minimize that. And because this is such a common thing, I'm going to go ahead and group this. Control G. Give this as our output. Head back up. Call this 2D vector from angle. Minimize this, bring it over. And now we have something that outputs the actual influence vector. Give me a moment to tidy this all up. 
and here it is. Again, you can take my word for it. I did the same thing where I hooked up these nodes as best as I could with the whole floor and ceiling thing. I made sure that all of these pieces went up to here like they did for that first one. Again, because I'm not going to need these four values later on in the calculation, I simply replaced their lanes with the actual vectors coming out of this. Now let's go ahead and calculate the dot product. We're going to use a vector math node. Set it to dot product. Minimize it because we got four. Now we just need to make sure that the upper left offset vector is paired up with the upper left influence vector and do that four times. And there we go. We have all the dot products set up. We're gonna take the next step into lerping, but I just want you to bear in mind that we have all these outputs to debug stuff later on. Honestly, I'm very proud of that, but we'll save that for the next episode, so be sure to check it out. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. If you really like the video, come on over to our Patreon page where you can get involved and see all the cool stuff we're doing.